My fascination with lost films has always been a peculiar part of me, a badge I wore with odd pride. I watched Citizen Kane, The Godfather 1 and 2, and The Lawrence of Arabia over a weekend as a nine-year-old kid who was sick and feeble and suddenly found an enchanting world in the movies. Over the years, I got my hands on all the old classics, especially the ones made in the golden years of Hollywood. But there was one movie I had only heard whispers of here and there on internet forums, which created a minor controversy upon release and was immediately pulled out. That's how I stumbled upon the dark web listing for The Shadow Beyond, a film rumored to have been lost since its only screening in 1952, a screening that ended in tragedy when the audience was found in a state of inexplicable terror, some even driven to madness. My friend Alex, equally intrigued by the macabre and unexplained, agreed to watch it with me, oblivious to the horrors we were about to invite into our lives. We set up the projector in my dimly lit living room, the reels emitting a faint, musty scent that seemed to whisper of forgotten times. As the film crackled to life, we were greeted with scenes that seemed mundane at first shadowy figures lurking in alleyways, a procession of faceless people marching through a fog-shrouded city. But there was something unnervingly hypnotic about the way these figures moved, as if they were more than mere projections of light and shadow. It's just a bunch of old film tricks. Alex tried to laugh it off, but his voice wavered, betraying his unease. We've seen modern horror movies. This would in comparison. As the film progressed, the imagery grew more disturbing. Scenes of indescribable rites and grotesque figures twisted in agony flickered before us, their silent screams echoing in our minds. It was then that we noticed the air around us had grown colder, the shadows in the room deepening, creeping closer as if drawn by the flickering images. Charlie, do, do you feel that? Alec's voice was a mere whisper, his eyes fixed on the shifting shadows that seemed to dance at the edge of our vision. I could only nod, my throat tight with fear. The film had cast a spell over us, a connection to something ancient and malevolent. We should have stopped it then, should have heeded the warning signs, but we didn't. Our curiosity, that insatiable human flaw, kept us rooted in place our eyes glued to the screen. That night, after Alex left, the real terror began. I tried to convince myself it was just the after effects of the film, my imagination running wild, but the shadows in my home seemed to move of their own accord, stretching and twisting into grotesque shapes that defied the laws of physics. Whispers filled the air, voices that seemed to come from nowhere and everywhere, speaking in a language I couldn't understand, yet filled me with an inexplicable dread. I barely slept, the few moments of rest plagued by nightmares that were too vivid, too real. Scenes from the film replayed over and over, but each time something from the shadows would turn its gaze directly at me, its eyes filled with a malevolence that chilled me to my core. The next day I called Alex, desperate for some semblance of normalcy, hoping he would tell me it was all in my head, but he didn't answer. When I finally reached him later that afternoon, his voice was strained, laced with fear. Charles, something's wrong. I saw one of them today, in the daylight. It was watching me from across the street, just standing there in the shadows. I blinked, and it was gone. But I know what I saw. His words sent a shiver down my spine. I had hoped what I experienced was a product of my own imagination, but Alex's encounter confirmed our shared nightmare was far from over. The days that followed were a descent into a nightmare we couldn't wake from. Alex and I tried to rationalize our experiences, to find a logical explanation for the shadows that seemed to stalk us, for the whispers that filled our ears with dread. But deep down, we knew we had tapped into something ancient, something evil, through the shadow beyond. 
One evening, as I sat alone trying to drown out the whispers with blaring music, I noticed a figure standing just outside my window. It was cloaked in shadows, its form barely distinguishable, but its presence was unmistakable. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest as I slowly raised a hand and pressed it against the glass. There was no sound, but the message was clear. I was not alone. Alex, it's getting worse. I confessed over the phone, my voice shaking. He was outside my house tonight. I don't know what to do. We have to find out more about the film. Alex replied, a determined edge to his voice. There has to be a reason why this is happening. Maybe there's a way to stop it. His words sparked a flicker of hope, and we spent the next day scouring the internet and old film archives for any mention of The Shadow Beyond. Our search led us to an obscure film historian who had written a paper on lost films, including ours. He agreed to speak with us, his curiosity piqued by our desperation. The historian, a gaunt man with eyes that had seen too much, listened to our story with a grave expression. When we finished, he sighed, his gaze distant. <sighs> You're not the first to experience this. He began, his voice solemn. The film was created by a cult in the early 50s, designed as a ritual to breach the veil between our worlds and the Shadow Realm. I believe they could control the shadows, use them for their own ends, but they were wrong. The shadows cannot be controlled, only unleashed. His words were a cold splash of reality. We had unleashed something we had no hope of controlling. What can we do? Alex asked, desperation creeping into his voice. The historian shook his head slowly. The original reel was supposed to contain a ritual for sealing the breach, but it was lost before it could be used. Without it, I'm afraid there may be no way to close the door you've opened. That night, the shadows grew bolder, more aggressive. Whispers turned to screams, the darkness alive with malevolent intent. Alex and I huddled together in my living room, the only light from the flickering candles casting long, terrifying shadows across the walls. We have to go back, I said the realization dawning on me. We have to watch the film again. There has to be something we missed, some clue on how to end this. Alex nodded, his face pale but resolute. We prepared ourselves, not knowing if we would survive the encounter, but knowing we had no other choice. The projector hummed to life, the opening scenes of the shadow beyond flickering onto the wall. We watched, our eyes scouring each frame for something, anything that might save us. But as the film reached its climax, something strange happened. The shadowy creature, which was featured in it, lifted a lamp and attacked the hero the first time that we watched it. But this time, it stopped in its tracks, turned, and it seemed like he looked at us. Suddenly, the room chilled to an unearthly cold and in a second, the creature leapt towards us, jumping out of the screen and into the real world. We screamed, but before it could reach us, we suddenly felt our blood pressure drop, and we passed out. When I woke up, everything was normal, but the reel automatically burnt off. The horror stopped that day, but what me and Alex saw that night, I wouldn't wish it upon my worst enemy. It all started as an innocent deep dive into the dark web. My friend Jamie and I, armed with nothing but our curiosity and a newly acquired dubious guide to the hidden corners of the internet, we stumbled upon a form that seemed harmless at first. A place where people shared secrets, unsolved mysteries, and the occasional conspiracy theory. It was exhilarating, feeling like we had uncovered a hidden world until we received a private message from a user known only as Watcher. Watcher claimed they had been observing us, noting our keen interest in the dark web secrets. 
The message was unsettling, but what froze our blood was the attachment. Files containing our personal information, photos and conversations we had in private, and details no stranger should know. The message was clear. We were being blackmailed. The first task seemed almost laughable. Walk into a crowded supermarket and scream a conspiracy theory at the top of your lungs. Embarrassing, sure, but harmless. We thought complying might end this nightmare, so we did it, recording the act as proof. This market is built on a graveyard! You're walking on ancient warlands! Jamie yelled. Ancient jewels are buried under this land. We have to dig it out. A stolen treasure was lost in the war and hidden right here in the graveyard. Watcher's response was a simple chilling, Well done. More to come. As days passed, the tasks grew increasingly bizarre. One demanded we paint our faces with grotesque makeup, attend a local high school football game, and cheer for the team in complete silence never breaking eye contact with the camera we were instructed to set up across the field. The video, once sent to the watcher, was met with approval and the promise of escalation. We wanted to quit, but we were reminded of our sensitive information once again. We have to come out, I said, holding Jamie's hands, but he pulled back. His parents would kill him if they knew his reality. The next one was something out of a horror story. We were to break into the local animal shelter at night, dressed as clowns, and release the dogs while live-streaming the entire act. The task was not only weird, but illegal. The sensitive information hung over us like a sword, compelling us to comply. We executed the task under the cover of darkness. Each task was a step further into the abyss, a descent into madness we couldn't escape. The blackmail was relentless, Watcher's grip on us tightening with each completed task. We were pawns in a sadistic game, our lives spiraling out of control. Jamie and I spent countless nights debating our next move, searching for a way out, but Watcher was always one step ahead. The tasks, each more demanding and dangerous than the last, were breaking us down, tearing at the fabric of our friendship. The final task arrived like a death sentence. Jump off your building at midnight and stream it. Do this, and you're free. Forever. The absurdity and danger of the request paralyzed us. This was no longer about humiliation or breaking the law. It was a matter of life and death. I remember sitting with Jamie in silence, the weight of our situation crushing. It was then, in the depths of despair, that a spark of defiance ignited within me. I couldn't, wouldn't let the Watcher win. I proposed a plan to call Watcher's Bluff to confront this monster head on and reclaim our lives. Jamie was hesitant, the fear palpable in his eyes. But eventually, he nodded in agreement. We were in this together, for better or worse. The night was pitch black as we approached the terrace, the cold air biting at our skin. We set up the live stream as demanded, but instead of complying, I turned the camera to face us and spoke directly to the watcher. We are done with this. You want to tell the world our reality? So be it. We'd rather face our parents' disappointment than jump to our deaths, you psycho. The silence that followed was deafening, a moment suspended in time where everything hung in the balance. Then, a message. Impressive. You're free to go. Relief washed over us, a feeling so intense it was almost euphoric. In the days that followed, peace enveloped our lives. The absence of Watcher's menacing presence felt like emerging from a long, oppressive shadow. But the peace was deceptive. In the wake of our rebellion, a haunting silence took hold. Jamie became distant, his once vibrant demeanor shadowed by something I couldn't decipher. Our conversations grew sporadic, filled with unspoken fears and the heavy burden of our recent past. 
I attributed his change to the ordeal we had endured, confident that time would heal the scars left by our encounter with Watcher. Then, one evening, I received a call that would shatter the fragile semblance of normalcy we had clung to. It was Jamie's mother, her voice cracked with emotion, informing me that Jamie had jumped off the building. His final act was broadcasted to an unknown audience. The world around me came to a screeching halt, reality fracturing into a million pieces. I raced down the stairs, refusing to believe what I had heard, only to be met by the flashing lights of police cars and a crowd of onlookers. The truth was undeniable, a crushing weight that threatened to suffocate me. Jamie had jumped, his decision a mystery wrapped in the enigma of our shared nightmare. In the days that followed, I was consumed by guilt and confusion. Why had Jamie jumped? Had Watcher returned to torment him? Or was the psychological toll of our experience too much for him to bear? I scoured our communications for any clues, any signs that I might have missed, but found nothing. The absence of answers was a torment all on its own. The realization hit me like a tidal wave. Our act of defiance on the bridge had been a facade, a moment of bravery that masked a deeper, more insidious despair. Jamie had been pushed beyond his limits. I failed to see the signs, too caught up in my own relief to notice the cracks forming in my friend's resolve. As I grappled with the aftermath of Jamie's death, a chilling discovery was made. The police informed me that the live stream of Jamie's jump had been traced back to a server associated with Watcher, but when they raided the place, they found a Chinese family living there who were illegal immigrants. Jamie's jump, whether a desperate bid for freedom or a final act of defiance, had been part of Watcher's game all along. A week went by in despair, but soon after the funeral, I got a message from an unknown number. Congrats, you passed the experiment. Who is this? You know who. Why did you do it? I didn't. He did it himself. This was the seventh experiment. Seven couples preferred dying over letting their secrets come out. Except for you. You stood up. That's a specimen who should live courageous. Who the hell are you? Why are you doing this? I just watch. Watch how my subjects play the game once I give them the push. You're a psycho. I know. You want to know what his last words were? What? What? Tell me now. He will be waiting for you to join him. In the end, the truth of what drove Jamie to the edge remained elusive, buried within the digital depths of the dark web. Our journey, which had begun as a thrilling escapade into the unknown, had ended in tragedy, a stark reminder of the dangers lurking within the shadowy corners of the internet. I share our story as a cautionary tale, a testament to the devastating impact of digital manipulation and the hidden dangers of the dark web. Stay safe.